And uh, they wanted something that was a little more agile, if you want to use the term. And they ended up getting a computer that they figured out how they could write compilers for it and make different languages. And they wrote this basic computer. So I learned in basic because it came with every computer that you could buy at that time. In 1982, you could buy a computer for about, um, in US money, um, you know, at least a lot less than buying a car. So I thought, I was in a company, I owned a little company where we made signage. You know, signage like on buildings, like these things that this says Agile India. We made signage and I, need, I knew I needed a computer. And so uh, I was painting, I was a, a painter, I painted letters. And so I looked up, uh, I would go to the magazines and the conferences and everybody was talking about computers, so I thought I better learn about computers. So I tracked down a couple computers, I bought one that was a general purpose computer, like a business, little business computer, and I bought one that was uh, very dedicated to manufacturing, it did certain kinds of manufacturing stuff. And the manufacturing one worked really well. And the, uh, but the general purpose one, the computer worked well, but the software was terrible. The software didn't work very good. And I talked to my wife and I said, we need software that works. And she said, um, clearly these companies are making money writing terrible software. If you learn to write software, maybe you can make money writing terrible software. <laughs> and so she, I said, that's pretty smart thinking. So I went ahead and I got, are we trying to get this one running yet? And uh, we may not be able to do the demo. We'll see what we do. So she, she understood every night I could program for a couple hours. We worked together in our business. I could program, but I couldn't afford to program um, all day long because I needed to work. I needed to pay my bills. And I couldn't afford to program for weeks and weeks and weeks without having any result from that. So what I did, I decided to work in this manner. This is 1982-83. I thought, if I can do something tonight that saves me 10 minutes tomorrow, I get 10 minutes more to program tomorrow. And then if I can do something tomorrow that saves me 10 minutes, now I have 20 minutes more that I can work, and on and on. So this is what I started doing. Every night I would make something I could use tomorrow, and then tomorrow it saved me more time and I could get more time programming. Over the next 15 years, I've spent more and more of my time programming, and then my wife played a really good trick on me. She said, we would not have to have this business if you would just go get a job as a programmer. And so I thought, okay. And so I went and got a job as a programmer. And she was very smart because she knew then she wouldn't have to work in our business if we got rid of our business. And this was a good trick she played on me. The end result was this, that I got a job in a place that was really wonderful, 1999. And we had a small team in a room that was probably equivalent to where the room divider is in here, Four. That's about how much room we had. And there were six people working there, and we worked as a team. Now, we didn't all work at the same computer, which is what mob programming we're going to learn about a little bit today is, but we worked with six people that could communicate with each other all day long, and as we did things, we were communicating. We had one really smart guy who owned the company, and he worked at the whiteboard. He would come in and say, oh, we got to do this, and then he'd go off to think some more, and we'd do the work. He had hired me for three months to help manage this company because he had to travel to some customers. And he wanted somebody there who understood both programming and management, which I've been doing for a long time. At the end of that three months, which I thought was just wonderful, we didn't do estimates, we worked as a team, we delivered stuff daily, 1999, we delivered stuff daily, we, um, we round-tripped with the customers continuously, all the things we now call Agile. So I thought, boy, if the small companies know how to do this, I bet the big companies really know how to do this. That's how stupid I was. Because I went to work on a project that's just spinning up. There was three or four that they were just starting in my area, and one of them was at Microsoft. But it didn't look like it was very much the way I wanted to work. But this other place, they were going to do six-week iterations, which I was used to like almost daily iterations. And they were going to do... Um, they were going to do retrospectives, but they called them lessons learned every six weeks. Well, we were doing lessons learned all the time, but I thought that's the closest I could get. So I went to this big company, and here's what I noticed. They put me on a team. They just hired 200 developers. A good handful of them were from, from India. Matter of fact, one of the most brilliant 
programmers I ever worked from was on that project. He'd come in from India. He would have three computers set up on his desk, one with C++, one with uh, Visual Basic, and one with something else that was part of the technology we're using, so he could debug across the c components in this system. I learned a lot from that person. But my point was, they put me on a team, they put this team in a room, and then we didn't do anything that was like a team. Could you imagine if you got onto a sports team, and they said, okay, it's time to play the game, you go play on that field, and you go play on that field. Will we be playing a game together? We're not on the same team. So I thought, why, why did they call this being on a team when we don't do anything like a team? So starting in 1999, I started taking notes. Everywhere I went, they put me on a team. Everywhere I was, I, we didn't do anything like teamwork. I went on about 10 contracts over the next two or three years, and then I decided I want to work inside the company. I don't want to be a contractor. So I got a job where I worked inside the company. Same thing, they put me on a team, and I started trying to find a way to make it into real teamwork. I didn't know what that would be like, except for I had one example, that first job. But by that time, 2001, Agile started coming out. I was reading a lot about it. I'm going, this is about teamwork as well. In fact, you, you're at an Agile conference. You're aware of the Agile Manifesto. Okay, the Agile Manifesto has some values, and then it has some principles that are combined with it. And if we could have a screen, I would actually show you that. But we don't. So I'm going to say it. It's things like working software over comprehensive documentation. Uh, collab uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So it had a lot of this stuff that sounded to me like it was about rapid feedback and teamwork. Almost every principle connected into those things. I wish they would have put one thing, one more principle would be, we value rapid feedback over whatever, you know? Because I think rapid feedback is a really useful thing. So over the next, from 1999 to 2009, I started experimenting with working as a team. I learned to do pair programming. Do any of you do pair programming? Okay, four, three, or four, or five. Um, I learned to do test-driven development. I will tell you right now, I don't think I could have got through those 10 years with any sanity in my brain still if I didn't learn about pair programming and test-driven development. Now, not everybody uses test-driven development but it allowed me to get through to the end of the day without wearing my brain out because I wasn't worried about a lot of stuff. Then in 2009, I started getting really active about thinking about this teamwork and I started looking for a company that was really willing or open to trying new things, experimenting with new ways of working. And I started experimenting with three people at one computer instead of just a pair. Well, in 2011, I got on this contract, but it was actually a job, they hired me to manage a team that was not doing very well. And that they, what they wanted was a hero who could come in and save the day. Well, I'm gonna warn you right now, there are no heroes coming to save the day. Not in your company, not in, in our industry, there are no heroes. You have to be your own hero. So when they came to, they asked me to come to work there, I said, as long as you let us experiment, I'm gonna come here. I have no interference for a year. Have we replaced the projector? That's what we need to try. That's the missing piece. <laughs> if that happens, then uh, I know a good garbage can, we can put that in. Oh, this is a, a close range projector. I should have brought my projector. Let's see what happens. At this place where I worked, it's called Hunter Industries. They, um, they agreed to do no interference for a year. I would work with the team for a year, and they couldn't tell me whether they liked it or not, or at least I wouldn't listen to it. The team itself would decide how they would work. The team would make that decision. And we stumbled upon, over a six month period, uh, a couple of things that have become critical. And that's what I'm here to share with you today. One of those things we called, I had learned, was called a coding dojo. Now these people that I'd learned that from, this came to me through a, one person who had heard another person talking about it at a conference. And this coding dojo goes like this. We have, in this particular model, we have five people. Three of them are observers. One of them is sitting at the computer, which is hopefully connected up to a projector. And, and one of them is standing. And the person standing is directing the work that's going to the computer. Now, this is not mob programming, but this is five people learning together at one computer. Now we spent about six months doing this every Friday for three hours. We would actually get together and learn something we needed to learn. Let's say we needed to learn 
microservices. Is this starting to work? No. That's very good. Okay. <laughs> this is interesting. Um, so we were studying every uh, Friday for three hours together, and the way we would do it is the coding dojo. That was a decision the team made. The team players said, I asked them, how do you want to arrange our learning? And we could, it looks like it's starting to work. <laughs> Excellent. I'll let them keep going. I'll finish this story because that way it'll be out of the way. So every Friday we would study something we want to learn technical. And usually we were trying to learn about cleaning up our code and refactoring the things that I know help that they wanted to learn. And then one day, uh, one of the team members came to the rest of the team and said, I have this project I'm working on, and it is a mess. And she was asking for help. Now she was the tech lead, she was the lead person on the team, but she was learning that if we gather everyone together, we could get a lot more done. And so we sat together that day to look at this code, and instead of just looking at it, we started working on it. So she was asking for some advice, but instead of advice, there's a thing called read by refactoring. Do any of you know of read by refactoring? You know what read by refactoring. What could that mean? Somebody tell me, what would it mean to read by refactoring? Why do we read? Why do we read code? To, understand the to try and understand it. So what would read by refactoring do? By doing it, by changing it. By doing it, we will learn more than by just reading it. And so we actually learned techniques where you don't need to understand the code. As a matter of fact, we were given a batch of code just for fun that was written in Russian. And I don't understand Russian. There are people in the world who do, I, I believe, but I don't. And none of my team members did. And we were able to work on it doing the read by refactor, by just figuring out what each little part did. And when you're refactoring, you, if you have a long method, and this code had a long method in it, and that long method was... It was about 400 lines, 500 lines of code. That's a little bit too long. I will ask Fred George, what's an appropriate length for your uh, method in code? If it's more than three, it's wrong. If it's more than three lines, it's wrong. That's from the expert. Okay, we had a rule of about 10 lines. Maybe 10 lines would be anything more than that, you better look at your code and figure out why. It was interesting. So when you read by refactory, the first thing you do is start extracting out what I call paragraphs. Chunks of logical of logic that you can remove. And as you do that, you start learning about what this code does, what the dependencies are, what the problems are. At the end of about two hours of doing this, somebody came into the room where we had met. We were in a room like this and said, you have to leave the room because we have a meeting scheduled in here. Is that how it is in your companies when you used to work at the same place? You know, you have a room for two hours and then somebody else has it for two hours. So we could have just gone back to our desks and said, okay, we'll have another meeting sometime soon. But as we stood up, one of the team members did something, and this is really critical, pay attention to this. As we were standing up, one of the team members said, let's just go find another room. That's a very packed statement. They were saying in that statement that, let's make sure we keep doing this, it's working so good. Their statement was, let's go find another room. So we did, we found another room that in our company we had about 50 meeting rooms. Uh, usually you can't find a meeting room at the last minute, but we found one. Why is it, what is that meeting room like, the one that you can find at the last minute? Anybody know? Why is that meeting room available? Projector doesn't work. Projector doesn't work. The projector doesn't work. The air conditioning doesn't work. Yeah? And, and maybe there's loud trucks on the street outside. That's exactly what we found. So we started, at the end of that day, we asked each other, what went well today? And somebody said, boy, this working together was really powerful. At the end of the day, we were doing a daily retrospective. And that daily retrospective, can you understand me well enough? Can you hear me OK? OK. That daily retrospective wasn't to look at what were the problems that day. That daily retrospective was to look for what went well today. And, and this is a habit I de de developed over several years. And we asked each other, what went well today? And there were six, five, six, seven of us. And this is what happened. Somebody said, boy, I learned a lot. And somebody else said, we got a lot done. And somebody else said, it was really high quality. And then somebody else said, I think the most important part, it was fun. If you work all day, and at the end of the day, you learned a lot, you got a lot done, uh, 
it was high quality and you had fun, would you want more of that? And so this was our habit. We would ask, how do we get more of that tomorrow? And somebody said, well, go right to the system right now and try to book some rooms for tomorrow. After two or three days of doing that, they said, why don't we just try to book room for a whole week? Couldn't find a whole week room. So, but we were finding whole day rooms. After two weeks, we said, we got to find a permanent room. So we found a closet. And we took everything in the closet and shoved it in the corner. We put our, uh, a desk like this in the middle and some chairs and got a projector that worked a little bit better than these and projected it up on the wall. And we started working that way. That was in 2011. And since 2011 till today, we've continued working that way. Now, I left the, the company in 2015 because I was getting invited to go all over the world and speak. And you can't work and do the speaking at the same time very well. And so the person that took over for me was somebody I hired specifically knowing he was, one of my, he was my first hire there, knowing that someday he, would, he could be the person that would take over for me. He was smarter than me. He was way more capable. He could read faster. He was better interacting with people. He was taller. He was handsomer. All the things that you need in a boss. And he took over for me, and he's still the manager there today, managing now 40 people instead of my seven. One manager for 40 people. And how does that work? It's because these people work as teams. You don't need to manage a team as five individuals. You manage a team as a team. So you don't need this. It's not, it doesn't have all the overhead. So I want to get to the actual demonstration part. So this is the way I propose that we're going to do it. Unfortunately, we only have this tiny little screen. Unless somebody brought a what? Pardon me? That's what I'm thinking. So the way that I'm going to do it is here because I want to demonstrate some stuff. And maybe everybody will come up and look as we do it. But not yet. Not yet. We'll do it when we get there. OK? There is always a way. There is always a way. My father, my father taught me something that was very important as a child. He didn't do this by telling me until I was, he was almost gone. He, had almost, he, was, he was on his deathbed. We were on a vacation. And I was, let's say, 10 years old. And I have five, there's six of us, five brothers and sisters, six brothers and sisters, plus my dad and my mom. We're out on a vacation, and the car breaks down. And we're pulling a big trailer. So he says, he pulls off the side of the road, and all of us are going, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He says, ah, don't worry. No big deal. He unhooked the car, was able to get it into town. Ended up, he had to replace the car. He had cracked the block in the engine. Years later, so all of us just played you know, while we waited for him. He came back with a, a used car, but a, a new car, a different car. Years later, I said, how did you have so much confidence that this would all work out? He said, I had no idea. But I acted as if it was all going to work out, because that would make a calm environment. And my wife also taught me that years later. She said, when somebody comes into the business, they don't really need the knowledge you have. They need the confidence that you're going to do the right thing. There's a big difference. So once I learned that, so in this case, what happened? I don't really still know. I have a feeling that that speaker wire is bad news. <laughs> and Bill Gates built into this system a way to recover it. So thank you, Bill, wherever you are. I don't think he's passed away yet, but he's actually two years younger than me. Why he made billions, I don't get it. I don't get it. But let's go ahead, and I need five volunteers. We're going to demonstrate a coding dojo. Now, coding dojo is very different from mob programming, or what I'm now calling software teaming. If you want to know why I've changed it to software teaming, maybe I can answer that later. I'm not telling anyone else what to call this. The very first day, the very first talk I gave on this in 2012, I called it whole team programming. And everybody wanted to talk about mob programming, because our team called themselves the mob programming team. So that became the natural name for it. I wanted to call it whole team. However, uh, I, don't, I don't buck the system. If somebody says call it mob programming, that's what people want, that's what we did. But there's two things with that name that I don't like, so I'm going to cover that real quickly. Mob has a negative connotation for some people. I pictured that as humorous. It was like an ironic kind of thing. We're not mobbing each other or other people. We're kind of more like um, 
uh, we're mobbing the code, maybe if we thought of it that way. But I see a mob as being a group of people who gather together to do something that they couldn't do alone. But you get a mob of people, and so it was kind of a joke that way, maybe. Uh, and, but other people didn't like it, so there's two things about it I don't like. Mob has a negative connotation, and programming, it's not just programmers. It's people creating the software. And on each team, we have way more people than just programmers. Now, we can usually staff a team with mostly programmers, but we also need knowledge that's outside of the coding part of things. So let's go ahead and call it something other than programming, so I called it software teaming. But I don't care what you call it. Call it anything you like. But I need some volunteers. I need to have five. Please come forward. Please come forward. Just stand up if you want to volunteer. Now, we've already got three guys, so there's got to be some other members of the... Uh, there we go, there's another one. So, okay, so this is like the numbers aren't quite perfect yet, but that's okay. So let's come and sit in these chairs. So we need to have, uh, we have four chairs, but we're gonna have five people. No, please leave that chair. We're gonna have four chairs. Just like musical chairs. Do you play musical chairs in India? <laughs> Same kind of thing. The person standing, so please have a seat, either one of you. You're gonna rotate, don't worry. The person sitting at the keyboard, I call the driver. You ever pick, you know, you've seen people, they drive a car and they've got the steering wheel. When you get in the taxi cab, and you're gonna have the taxi cab driver take you somewhere, you don't get in the taxi and go, where should I go today? And then they, 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 you know, the taxi cab driver says, well, there's a cricket match over here. Okay, let's go there. Oh, but you know, I also have to go to the airport before two o'clock. That's where we really want to go. So we get in the cab, we're going to say, take me to the airport. So when you're the driver, you just do as you're asked. Somebody has to give you information about what to do. So this is how the coding dojo works. A coding dojo is a social learning mechanism that allows us to learn together the same thing. We're all trying to learn the same thing. And in this case, it's going to be right here. Kind of going to be difficult, but we'll just look as best as you can look at the screen, okay? That's, that's what we need to do. I should have brought a big screen. I don't know what I was thinking. What's that? Yeah, that, 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 we had a lot of bad luck doing that. Yeah, I, I almost got electrocuted. So we're not gonna try that. We're not gonna try that. They're still trying to figure that out. So the person at the keyboard is the driver and their job is to act like a smart input device they're a peripheral of the computer. They're part of the computer while they're sitting there. But we're gonna rotate. This is in the coding dojo. It's a social activity. So every four minutes is the way we, we would typically do it. Everybody would stand up and we would rotate. And then the navigator, the person who's guiding them, the one who got in the taxi cab and said, let's go to the airport, they now become the driver. And the next person in row, they stand up and they're gonna become the navigator and they'll guide the process on. And usually, we'll have a whiteboard nearby, and it's really handy to have a marker. Thank you. Now see, that was helpful. Thank you so much. And I didn't get electrocuted. <laughs> Doubly good. So let's say that our problem was, if we put input a one, it will output, and I'll make an output like that, a Roman numeral I. Now I don't know where Roman numerals were invented, but I'm gonna guess they were invented in Rome. I'm pretty sure here in India, you figured out math stuff before the Romans did. Am I right about that? Does anybody know the history of math in India? They usually, yeah, they, 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 definitely the Romans didn't quite, they knew what zero meant. There are no more soldiers. Like, we, <laughs> we lost the battle. The only no reason they needed numbers was to make sure they had more soldiers than the other guys, or they were collecting enough taxes. That's what they needed numbers for. So this, the navigator, needs to guide how this is going to happen. And that means we have to have a development environment. We're not going to open up the development environment yet because I want us to learn the rotation mechanism. Now, I don't know any of your names. I see you all have the name tags, but um, so workshops. Oh, no, no, okay. <laughs> Sid, Sid. Ratina. Yeah, Siva. Siva. Harshit. Harshit. Gayatri. Gayatri. I will forget all those names. And I apologize for that. I did a workshop yesterday. There might be somebody here from the workshop right now. I worked with them all day long, and at the end of the day, I could kind of say some of their names. So I apologize for that. I work at it. 
the navigator becomes the driver. The driver goes to the end of the line, and the person at the beginning of the line, or I'm not sure if that's the end of the beginning, they become the next navigator. So we're going to practice that first. And she came back the next morning to show us the result they had. And it was better than what the programmers had done. So it's kind of a weird world. By the time a child is two years old, they're about as smart as they're going to be, and they're much smarter than us. It's all downhill after that. OK, so when the timer goes off, it'll sound something like this. That's the tire wheels. Okay, no sound. So when that goes up, we rotate. Now I didn't give you very clear instructions yet, so let's see if you can do it. Time to rotate. Rotate. Now that was exemplary. <laughs> Teams usually can't get that the first time. But, uh, he did the exchange by till what point he's finished or I finished, you know, and then he said that. <laughs> Let's say I have finished the method. If I have not finished the method, will I just say that stop? Let me finish this method no. before I. So no. it's just like with the keyboard. Okay, let's say you're typing away at the keyboard, you're working alone. Type away at the keyboard and say, oh, I'm going to go get some lunch. And you stand up walking away, and the keyboard says, We're not done yet. And it keeps typing without you. <laughs> the keyboard cannot keep typing without you. So in this case, the person sitting here who's the driver, they can't do anything without the rest of the team guiding them. Have we already lost my. No, I'll bring it up. It doesn't matter yet. We'll bring it back up in a minute. It's not good. Make sure I don't use that. I'm going to take a chance and plug the electricity. I had one of these. Uh, this is a Dell computer. In the, in the U.S., uh, one of the companies you can get computers is called Dell. And I bought one similar to this, a little bit smaller because it was lighter weight. And uh, I was uh, using it one morning, and uh, I don't know what happened. But I think that the charger, with this plug into these, you need an adapter. And uh, I don't know what happened, but the electricity uh, behaved poorly and it blew up the, uh, it blew up my computer. And so I contacted them, they just gotten out of warranty. And so I, uh, uh oh, I may not have the correct adapter. Do you have an adapter that'll work for this? This type will take this. No. Yeah, we'll blow up immediately. <laughs> Maybe you can figure out how to get them. Switch it off. Yeah. Technology sends the strong messages. It's a hardware thing. Okay. <coughs> That's working right now. <laughs> Cross your fingers. That is not blown up yet. Yes. No. Let's see if I can get it to uh, come back on. Uh, not too bad. I don't know why it's thinking I wanted to open that. Uh, we're not going to worry about it for the moment. But you got that plugged in now. Yes, yeah, so we can switch yes. to your one. So let's switch it to mine. Yes. So we need to plug into this. Let's see, maybe we uh, make sure we've got enough cord. <laughs> If all of us get through today still alive, I'm going to be really pleased. Don't worry, it's going to work. That thinks it's working. Yes. <coughs> yes. One last try. We'll go on. Okay. So the driver acts as a peripheral of the computer. They don't do anything unless they're asked to, but that, that request could be at a very high level. Um, so we had the other, could I ask for a second? We had that other computer working. Pardon me. We had that other computer projecting, right? Yes. Maybe we can use that computer. Yes, you can do that. Let's, give, let's see if we can get that projecting again. 
And then we'll use a different development environment than what I got. We probably won't have time to do much coding. But this is how work usually goes, right? They wait till the very last minute, then they go to the programmer and say, here's what you need to do, you gotta have it done by tomorrow. Okay? That's the tradition amongst software developers. Okay. Yes, there's two. Yeah, when will you need to have it done installed? So, let's go ahead and rotate a second time. So, if the timer goes off, let me make the sound. Rotate. Okay, these folks got it immediately. You are better than maybe 90% of the programmers in the world. So, thank you for being able to do that. If that is working, then let's, um, let's go ahead and bring that over here. And I'll just close that up. That's all right. This is just my power. That's it. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Okay. We're actually going to get up to a little coding problem. Can you, uh, at the keyboard, I'm going to navigate you for a minute. That means I'm the one guiding. I'm the one telling you we're going. I've got the job. I, I've got. Um, you're the navigator and you're the driver. Now you can call these other things. Some people say it's the. The thinker and the typist. You can call whatever you want. I got those terminology, driver navigator, from the old time pair programming terminology for it. Some people call this driver navigator. They sometimes call this strong pairing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you can navigate in a browser to uh, cyber dojo.org, we're actually going to try to do something. Can you get to a browser here? Very good. Cyber-dojo.org. Hooray. I worked with a doctor about four years writing a program. He was trying to do electronics, medical electronic records, and doctor-patient interaction. He happened to come from India. He was a teacher at a big medical, uh, Stanford, big medical, college in California, and he lived down in my area, and he wanted this software. And so he learned to program so he could have the software, but when it got too difficult, he went out and looked for somebody to help, and I helped him a little bit now and then, and then one day, uh, his head programmer quit, and uh, he called me up and said, what do I do? And I said, well, why did they quit? I said, well, I was yelling at them, I said, this is easy, don't yell at them. But he said, well, it's too late. So, from that point on, I kind of took over the project, and what I tried to do is tiny steps so that the people there could take, make progress going forward, and we're gonna do that right now. So I'm gonna navigate in tiny steps. If you could go ahead and hit the Create a New Practice. And let's select Roman numerals. Did you notice he saw another thing with Roman in there, but he knew it wasn't the right one? I didn't need to tell him, you're going the wrong way. Could you imagine you got in that taxi, the taxi driver starts taking away, and you go, oh, look out, there's a red light. Oh, there's a pedestrian over there. Oh, watch out for the dog. The taxi driver's going to pull over and say, I don't need your money, get out of the cab. Right? Yeah. So you give too much direction, that's not good. Just the right amount. And you can tell when you've given too little, because the driver can ask, I, didn't I don't quite know what to do. So, we've selected that, we hit the next button. And the next button will take us where we choose a language. Now, I don't know what language kids use nowadays, but I learned C Sharp, but I'm gonna use Java here. So let's choose Java. I actually learned first in basic. I don't know if they've got basic in there. Uh, but if you just find Java, and uh, use it, the one is Java 18, with uh, J unit. That gives us a baseline that a lot of people are, are you off? What languages do you program in typically here? Java? Java, Python, Ruby. Python, Ruby. Any other languages typically? JavaScript. JavaScript. JavaScript is probably the most common one I see nowadays. And it's really not an easy place to work. But a lot of people use it. Okay, so now we can hit the next button again. So I'm navigating. I'm guiding the process. He doesn't do anything without me saying. Matter of fact, when I do this demonstration, sometimes people skip ahead. When you skip ahead, you think you know where we're going, and it may not be the way, so that slows us down. So if your keyboard skipped ahead, would you use that keyboard? You would quit using that keyboard. 
You are the keyboard right now. So the, key, the person at the keyboard, you're the smart input device. But don't get me wrong, I don't compare humans and devices. I don't think humans are devices. Devices are dependent. They show up on time. They do their work. They never sleep. Yeah, I can't compare them. To. There's no comparison. That's a joke, of course. So we could just hit ensemble. Ensemble is another word some people brought in to describe a pair of uh, mob program because it sounds kind of nice. So we set that. And now if we hit the OK button, we're not really needing to use ensemble here. We can use because we're going to act as a single user. And this takes us to a development environment. And it, it has version control, we won't worry about it unless we need this, but it's telling us we have these traffic lights that tell us when, when a test passes, when a test fails, and when a test goes green. So this, yes sir? Uh, was the code so that if we all distributed, we can enter that code and then read Yeah, so if you have 10 programmers who are going to do this for fun, and they're distributed all over the place, they could actually just take the URL, take the, the uh, what do they call that? Yes, that's the URL, right? Yeah. And, Send it out in Zoom and everybody click on it, they'll all have this environment. There's one trick, you can use remotely. Only the driver should hit the test button or type stuff. Because otherwise it gets out of whack. And it tells you, hey, are you mob programming? It actually says that. Are you mob programming? Something's gone wrong, you're out of order. So that, that means the other person didn't hit the test button. You didn't hit the refresh button since the other person last hit the test button. We're going to hit the test button. So let's close that window. Sorry for making you stand so long. Are you okay? Okay. He's young. He can take it. That's okay. If you need to take a call, that will Okay. Hit the test button, and we will see the test fail. There's one test in there. It comes from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Has anybody read that book here? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? There's a joke in there about the answer to everything. And it says it here. Life, the universe, and everything. Expected 42, but was 54. So let's see why our test failed. If we go to the code, well, let's look at the test first. Go ahead and hit the thing that says hypertest Java. Yeah, that file. And that'll show us the test code. This is one little test to make sure it's working OK. And it's, it's expecting a 42, but what we got back was 54. So let's look at the code in, in the hiker.java. And can anybody tell me why this isn't working properly? Six times. Yeah, so we don't know what base we're supposed to be working in. This is base 13, I think. Does anybody know? Six times nine in base 13, I think, is 42. Oh, we're working in base 10. I, does anybody have base 13 in their <coughs> computer? Okay. I don't know. So let's make this pass. And we're going to make it pass by just returning 42. Hard code the number 40. <coughs> so I'm the, I'm the navigator, and he just does what I just asked. Just return the value 42. If we run that, uh, let's see, is it closing off properly? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we need a semicolon and get rid of that last uh, thing. Oh, oh, I see. No, never mind. That's good. Hit the test button. We'll find out. Mm -hmm. In fact, you never need to try and figure out, is that code going to pass? Why? Because it's going to tell you anyways. It didn't even compile for some reason. Oh, it did pass. It did pass. Okay, we're passed, so we're good. <coughs> That's because that we just got the bracket on the wrong line, but Java doesn't care about that. That's right. Faithfully, we're not working in Python. Right. Oh my. They don't even have curly braces in Python, do they? No. no. What were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I learned in basic. They didn't have curly braces in basic. But that was during the war. There was a shortage on curly braces back then. <laughs> okay, so now we've actually got something working. And we're going to go ahead and rotate. So we did, took a long time to get here, but let's go ahead and rotate. So rotate. And now I'm going to use the timer. And I'm going to time as we go. And the first thing we're going to need is a test for this first requirement. So you're going to guide, and this is Sivanish. Sivanish. 
I worked with a gentleman in uh, California in that 1999 project whose name must have been 15 syllables. He was from India. But I guess you don't all have really long names, right? But some people here have really long names. But this is easy. I can kind of get that. And I apologize. I, I have a very short name comparatively to some of these names here, but it's still hard for people to say sometimes. I'm really good. So you got a guy that needs writing a test. Do you know how to write tests in Java? Okay, let's go to the test file. I'm going to teach you something that's very, very valuable. We get paid an amazing amount of money to copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> All you need to learn is how to copy and paste, and they'll pay you to be a programmer. Okay? Just a little secret. Well, the, I let the secret out because they're recording this. <laughs> Can you guide? Yeah. Do you know how to do testing? Yeah. Okay, let's see what happens. Um, given the input one, um, when the message now you're going to have to describe the new method we'll need. So besides the test, we'll need uh, a new method. Okay. So that's the level of the That's that's about where you just started was enough, unless uh, seven ish. Check uh, completely. So if the you said taxi driver take me to the airport, and he doesn't know how to get to the airport. You say just go down this road for fifteen miles. <coughs> And I'll guide you after that. So you watch, and whatever he does, you guide him as needed. Can you create a new method? Or maybe you can just copy. The so we want the test, the test first. In the test file. We're going to write the test first. Yes, you are correct. Thank you so much. Just the message. That's for the power plug-in yeah, or for the mouse? Yeah, for the power. There's a mouse at the moment. If you like the mouse, there's a mouse. We might as well plug it in. Now, while they're doing that, I can be talking to you, and that won't disturb them. What we found, as soon as we start working this way, was we're full, we can maintain enough focus so the rest of the navigators, in this case, they are not allowed to talk, we'll explain that in a minute. They can be discussing the next thing we're going to do. This is sort of how we would do mob programming. Now he's guiding. Now this is not mob programming, let's be very clear. This is a coding dojo that uses a lot of the same techniques as mob programming because we borrowed those techniques from the coding dojo to do the mob programming, but a coding dojo has a little bit more uh, strict rules, strict rules, to keep it from becoming chaos. But once you get good at working with each other, you don't need those strict rules. This is like when you're a child and you're going to play a game. You, you see some kids down the street and they're playing some game you've never seen, and you go to a kai play. What do they usually say? Yeah, come on, join me. So you get in and you say, well, what are the rules? They say, oh, don't worry, you'll learn. And so you just start playing the game. And in a minute, somebody hits you, you know, with a ball or something, and they say, you're out. And then they explain that rule. And then you step over here and they go, you're out. Well, why? Well, you went out of the boundary line. So you learn that rule. Pretty soon you've learned all the rules, and you're playing with these kids, and you're all friends. And that's, how, that's at least how my childhood was. I only got beat up very infrequently. OK. We're just letting them work. I actually like this process. I get a big kick out of this. We're watching developers in their native environment. So we watch really well. Okay. Yes? So I understand you're not allowed to. That's right. What exactly are you doing? You're thinking about what you're going to do when it's your turn. Yeah, so I'll explain that. The driver, the navigator is guiding the driver, but the observers, I'm calling them observers for the moment, they're waiting their turn. There's a very valuable thing we're learning when we're doing this. We're learning to keep our mouths shut. If we can't keep our mouths shut, it's very difficult to work on the team. 
So when it becomes your turn, though, you've been watching this process, and you're ready for the next step. And that's what your job's to be. I have one rule about this. When it becomes your turn, you can't say, I don't like this. Delete everything. You have to take it. You have to take the next logical step. So this is this is for the social activity of doing a coding dojo. Not necessarily how we would do mob programming. We don't take turns navigating, at least the way I do it. Navigate. We navigate as a team. Now you're doing pretty good, and no pressure, but you got 13 seconds left. Can you can you run the tests? Yeah, you could go ahead and run the tests. And who knows what we're going to see happen here? I like where we're at, right? And it's telling us some stuff we need to deal with. So the timer's just now going off. I'm going to turn up the volume so you can hear that for the next time, I guess. And let's rotate. Now, it doesn't matter where we're at. We learned this. <coughs> I learned to do this in doing the coding dojo with dozens and dozens of user groups. I go to user group, we do this activity, and then we pick something they wanted, some kind of little software they wanted, and we'd actually create it. And I learned that as soon as that timer goes off, we just rotate. Otherwise, everything slows down. So now it's your turn to guide. And what was your name, sir? Hushit. Hushit. And your name is? Uh, guide Tree. Guide I'm getting close. So you can you guide me on now? OK. Now no, it's, it's our decision whether to fix it, fix the issue that is coming in, or go ahead and complete the test. Yeah, complete the test and get it running. Let's look at the test case again. Now, one thing I learned from a really great programmer was let's look at the output. The output tells us our first problem. Um, we need a new method. It's telling us that that one doesn't accept a parameter. So, we probably need to invent a new method. Let's create a new method. Write the test first. the test and first, then write a new method. Uh, answer one is not uh, I, so answer. Oh, answer doesn't even include a parameter. So we have to uh, create a new method first. From the method, we have to create a test first. So call out the line number you want them to change. Um, uh, you have to uh, change the line number three. And uh, remove the uh, method. Remove the entry. Uh, Whatever you're given as a one. So you'll need the parameter. Uh, okay. So you have to create a new method. You have to create a new method to test that. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to give a little guidance. Yeah. Just call a new method. Give a new method name to call. Okay. It doesn't exist yet. Yeah, it doesn't exist. There is um, a coding dojo test. Coding. Coding. The fewer the letters. Yeah, yeah. Coding, code, code, code one, that's it. Coding, that's it. Coding, and then I'll call this, and then test, and then obviously this is. They'll tell you your next problem. Yeah, that's it. Test. And then now you go and uh, call the. Uh, go to cycle.org. We know that this is the, that the, such a method doesn't exist. Go to the method. So I'm going to come to this. is like Shakespeare, method. right? The, the guy's always talking to the audience. Uh, the recipe uh, here. Uh, I'm letting them struggle through this. Because we're not trying to learn how to code. We're, we're trying to learn how to interact with each other. There's a big difference. Now, I played music when I was a young boy. And, and I wanted to play with a band. So first you practice alone to learn enough so you can get somebody in a band to say, yeah, come play with us. But now you have to learn how to play with a band. So you got to learn some stuff alone, and you got to learn some stuff as a team. Did we get the picture here? This is part. Right now, they already know how to code. They're trying to learn some stuff about working as a team, and maybe in a language they're not used to. Okay. Oh, by the way, I can act as Google if you need Google. I can help you if you need me. Return, uh, for now we can say uh, the string line. Uh, if of uh, an input yes. equal to one, uh, return string. Go ahead, speak up. Uh, we can actually next round, we can create a parameter. Yeah. Yeah. Forcefully get into the yeah. shut, shut them off down. Yeah. So, how does that facilitate the knowledge sharing? Something that you can when, it's, when we're working this way, we will mostly have the skills we already need for interacting, I mean, for, for writing the code and for doing our other work. We're just bringing the people together. Okay. So, they were struggling for other reasons. 
but that's just part of the fun of this. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, we practiced doing a coding dojo for six months before we even realized we wanted to work together this way. And so now I can take a team, if I'm doing a workshop, I can take a team who's never tried this, and by the end of the day, we're working on real work, or by the next morning, we're working on real work. So you get through the, the bits of the mechanics of this, you have 27 seconds, no, 26, it keeps changing. You have only a few seconds left, but you get the picture. So this, it just gets us used to the mechanics, and we usually lighten up the rules until at the end of the day of my workshop, we don't have any rules. Oh, you can do the rest of the rules. Yeah. Because it's, it's more like, um, how does this team want to interact? Not, what do I think they need to do to interact? But we start with, what do I think they need to do? There's our rotation, so we stand up and rotate. Okay. Um, I just want to get them started so they can make their own decisions. So your navigator will guide you. Oh, uh, can you go back to the implementation? No, I've done this a thousand times. <coughs> I love it. Take the method that you created and I use the tool of this facility. And I'd like you to put it inside the class body. The problem is that you. Okay. So this is based on line number six here. You so line numbers are really important. You can learn to use line numbers. If you see the basic line ah, number okay. six, that means that your class is ended, which is where you have a problem. When somebody says it's obvious, what they mean is it's obvious to me. He's doing a really good job because he saw the problem and he wanted to say the solution, but now he has the chance to see the solution. Sure. And this is uh, why you use all your white highlights. It is to 13 and indent them all out. Yeah. All this indentation and stuff is forced on you in the pipeline. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. And we lost a little bit of time at the beginning. I don't know if any of you were here, but we got a slight technical issue. Uh, we were nearly electrocuted. And um, so we lost a little time. But we're still making pretty good progress. Line number 90. We will need to change the type to this chip. And we need to convert this chip to the other portion of So he's navigating at a very uh, a really great, finely great level. That's, that's the right word. And sometimes you need to do that. So you express your idea at the highest level possible, and you go down to the details as needed. So if I was guiding, I, 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 I wanted to take a taxi to go see a place that one of my ancestors lived in 1630 in England. I didn't know what the place looked like. I had some instructions. You pass the church, make a right turn, go over three bridges, Make a left turn. Where the old barn, burnt down barn, is still partly standing, you're going to make another right turn. So that's what the instructions were like. I couldn't say to the taxi cab driver, please take me to the farm where my great grandfather, eight great grandfathers back, lived in 1630. Because he doesn't know who I am and he doesn't know where my great grandfather is. But my instructions could get us there. So we give details. But if I were to say, take me to the airport, he would just have to ask one question Is he Heathrow you want to go to? Or What's the other one? Gatwick or something. He doesn't need to know anything else. So they navigated the level that's necessary to do the work. Now we haven't yet compiled for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> but we're going to eventually, and the test passed. All right, so we're ready for a new requirement. Now this is a very, very simple programming problem, but I use it for teaching how to see duplication. In this case, for the test-driven development, what you try to do is you try to do the simplest thing you can to get the code passing, and then you look for problems in the code and correct it. I'll let you continue on. You have 28 seconds left. Okay. So in hyper test, now that we're doing I would like you to create a new test. Uh, where uh, 
to follow the same language as a cross tag, so you can copy that and go Yeah. Now that was very good navigation. If you didn't hear, you say I want to test just like the other one. If you want, you can copy and paste it. It doesn't need to tell much more, because she probably knows what to do, and it's time to rotate. Okay. <laughs> so you stand up, hit the, you don't need anything to hit the test button, just stand on up, stand up, and rotate. Like when we get good at that, things move quickly. Okay. Now he has to switch his brain from, I was just navigating, to now I'm following directions. Mm -hmm. Now, this was our strict Cody Dojo approach that I used. You don't need to do it this way. You could rotate the other direction where the, nav the driver becomes the navigator. I didn't like how that worked. I, I found this worked better for user groups and stuff, but you do it the way you want. Are you ready to take it further? Yeah. All right. Did you hear that confidence? It's like my father in the car. You know, the car broke down, and my dad's going, I don't know if I even have enough money to get this fixed. But on the outside, he said, yeah, no problem. Just play. I'll be back in a little while. <laughs> he just said, yeah, I'm ready to go forward. Full confidence. <laughs> now the navigator oh, is the I only one allowed to speak. Okay. Boy, everybody was ready for that. <laughs> 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 So the driver has to just release the thing and let the other person know. I've done this so many times in real work that my, that my serious um, advice is the driver just releases thinking and just focuses on it. So we're separating the problem and solution area from the coding area. Can I ask a question? You can ask him a question. Exactly. You can ask a clarifying question. Okay, now you, you, if you know how to do it, you just do it. So the instruction was what, what was the instruction? The instruction is. Okay, so you need to have a method to. So I think what he's saying is we need a conditional so we can return it to. So we, we, we can infer, because this is why I, I like to have a smart input device. We can speak to them like a human. They can fill in the gaps. Our keyboard cannot fill in the gaps. Our keyboard, just, you click on it and it does something. With this, you click on it, but in a very much higher way. We just say, write a new method, and we do that. Uh, put in a condition, and we do that. There's probably 10 different ways to do this. In fact, there are probably a hundred different ways to do this. And my father would correct me, and he would say, there's a thousand right ways to do anything, so we must never think oh, yes. ours is the one right way. So that's good to remember. Combine. Past. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I would clap for you, but I'm holding my phone. So I'll give the jazz hands. I didn't give hardly any direction on that, but the point is, so I'm going to stop this pause so you don't lose your whole turn that you kind of caught on to how this works, and now everybody's got a pretty good idea. This will go a lot smoother. Now, the problem with this little uh, example we gave so far, so when I'm using this to teach duplication, problems duplication, we already see that there's essentially two ifs here. We only see one written out, but this is the problem with duplication. Duplicate things don't necessarily look exactly the same. So in this case, we say if input is equal, equal to or equals one, do this. Else, if it equals anything else, so that's an implied if, right? So we already can see there's a smell, but I think it was Bob Martin or somebody who said the first duplicate code comes for free. Wait till you really see the pattern. So I'll give you another one. You solve it the simplest way you can, and then we'll look at removing the duplicate code if we have time. And you know. I didn't know much more than this, what we're doing right here. The first day I started deciding I, I need to write code for myself. So we had the computer for a couple months. I decided I need to learn to write code. I wrote a little stuff like this. And then I said, I need some software. And I can't just do this. So what is the first thing I need to do? You need to input some data. What's the next thing you need to do? You need to save it to a disk. 
That's all I needed to learn to have something that I could use. And then the next day, I need to be able to print it out. So I have to learn how to print it. And it's gonna be awful, use little big dot matrix printers. So you have to learn how to format your printing. Each little thing you learn a little bit at a time, and pretty soon, well, you're old enough to retire and then you don't work anymore. <laughs> so that's what happens. So I'll let you guide on. I'm going to turn your timer back on. Okay. Yes. Do you see? Immediately go to a test. How many of you do test driven development? Okay. If you don't, it's worth learning. I would be much crazier than I am if I didn't have test driven development. We are supposed to go till three and that's all ready. Even though we lost a half hour at first, I don't know how much we lost. We made really good progress. I'm quite impressed. So he has a pattern that's already working, and he's following the pattern, and this is the way I like to do test driven development. Get the thing passing as quick as you can, and then let's figure out how we're going to make that clear. Now this isn't part of mob programming, but I like to have the test driven when I'm doing mob programming, and I like to take baby steps. Ken Beck will say, you learn to take the baby steps, and then you can learn to run. But if you can't take the baby steps, you can't run confidently. Passing, everything's passing. Why didn't, we, why didn't we get a failing test, though? Did we forget to run our tests before? Oh. Yeah, you mean between? Each time we write a test, we have to run it to see it fail. Yeah. So we'll do that as we go forward. Uh, okay. But now, that timer just went, so let's rotate. Okay. But now what we need to do is start refactoring the code. There's a pattern in the code. And your job as the observers right now, you're going to think about what you're going to do when it's your turn. If 7-inch uh, doesn't come up to results it wants, you've got to be thinking about how you're going to bring this further. So what we need to do now is work on our code that handles 1, 2, and 3, getting rid of the duplication. So what's the pattern is what you need to be thinking about. How can I make this more algorithmic than just brute force? Because right now it's brute force. You know, if you go if you go in into to the kitchen, you say, uh, "I want something," and so your your uh, kid opens the refrigerator, and then they point to the first thing. You say, "No, not that." They point to the second thing. No, not that. Point to the third thing. No, no. If you came up and said, "Hey, I would like a coke," they could just get you the coke. That's the algorithmic way to do it. We don't want brute force of pointing to each one. They call this "don't dial every number," and so we want a more programmer way to do it. So your tests are all passing and everything's good. So now we need to go to the code and refactor to get, so you might want to talk out loud, you might want to use the whiteboard where you'll say, uh, here's my idea. And then once we have the idea, we'll try to turn it into code. So do you have an idea how you would get rid of those ifs? So it's his pattern, it's his, he, you're the keyboard. <laughs> you don't get to talk. If your keyboard talked back to you, you would throw the keyboard away and go see your doctor. <laughs> or a priest. Or a priest. Because like, uh, Exercise if, the <laughs> if one is equal to this, this is what we have planned. This but if you want to remove the if. We want to get rid of the ifs and get this, keep the same results. How do we do that? That's our job now. Because like, uh, are we Ah, so I'm going to put a pause on here. He came up with a solution. And if I was working this way, I would say, let's try it. Yeah. Okay? But I'm going to jump to the end on this one because I want us to see. He has come up with a slightly different solution. And this is how I like to explain it. If I'm sweeping up in the kitchen, when I'm done sweeping, I should take the dustpan. Get the stuff in the dustpan and put it in the trash. Right? Okay. But what if I sweep up? Nobody's looking, so I just shoot everything under the refrigerator. <laughs> what did I actually do? 
I didn't clean up. I just moved the mess from out here to somewhere where it's even harder to work on. And I don't want to move the mess. So we put this in an array. We're going to kind of just, we're moving the mess. We're still needing to work with each of these in our code somewhere, and we don't want each of those in our code. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I don't mean to throw away your idea, because it actually will work. And I usually wouldn't skip ahead, but we have almost no time. Yeah. What I'd like you to think is think of something that would be even less than having an array. Less, um... Why do you gas exception? Well, I don't think we're ready for that. <laughs> we can have a class for each number, from one to <laughs> infinity. <laughs> well, we kind of have that. Conceptually, these are primitive, so... But, uh... Now, take your time to think about it. You have two, three minutes almost, so don't, uh, I'll just be quiet and see if you can come up with an idea. And you should be thinking about what idea you want to use in case he doesn't know. Not yet. We'll go these three minutes, nobody's talking. I know I put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I am on the spot. But that's okay. We, as a team, we learned that we can't all have all the answers all the time. Last time I was touching the board, you told me. There's at least one pattern here that we need to see. All of a sudden, we're not here. That's why every time it doesn't stop, we just slow down. Those of you who are watching from home, just take a break. I would suggest that there might be a better way without any hits. Your array solution would remove the hits as well. So I know that would work and we can code it quickly. I want to take the step, the next step. So it's like variables we will use be variables. That's the kitchen example. <laughs> we don't need to know about these things in code. Every coding problem is unique. The first time we come upon something, we need to do a little thinking. Then we start seeing some patterns. And when we start learning those patterns, we start thinking a little easier. So let's go ahead and rotate. Let's go ahead and rotate. And I want to answer one question that had come up. You had a question. Um, the person who's sitting in the very seat cannot even discuss with the navigation. Right. So this is an important part. One of the very strict rules I have when we're doing the coding dojo is that the person in the, in the driver's seat does not use their brain for the solution. So we don't get their solution. When you're mob programming, if you're in the driver's seat and you have the only idea we're trying, or you think you have the only idea and nobody else is coming up with one, what should you do? Step out. Step out. Okay? This is what keeps this from being us just watching somebody coding. That was sort of what we dealt with by having it this way. Otherwise, we're just going, oh, I know what to do, just watch. That doesn't work, I found. Then you become the navigator and you want something. So the driver would become the navigator. This rotation is for the coding dojo. We would not necessarily do that when we're mod programming. Some people do rotate, but I, I typically would. Whoever feels appropriate, they would just say, oh, I, I can navigate this, and they stand up and navigate. And the rest of the team allows that to happen. Remember my original story. Somebody on the team said, let's find another room and keep working this way. That's the person with the idea, and it's our job. This is a secret to working with a team. When somebody else expresses intent, we run with it. Now think of a sports team. If any of you ever played like uh, basketball or football where you keep the ball around, you know what I'm talking about? If the team member gets the ball, 
They don't turn over and look at someone and say, what should I do with it? Right? What do they do? They look around for someone else who's open, and they get the ball to them. I played soccer, and they call it soccer in the U.S. When I was in high school, my senior year, there was no competition. No other school in our district had a soccer team. So we were the champions because we couldn't lose. But the point I'm making is, is that you can't play a game like soccer or football if you don't pass the ball. You know? And you can't have, how many people on a soccer team? 11? You can't have 11 goalies. You will never lose and you will never win with 11 goalies. Because they can't even get the ball in there. The whole goal is filled with goalies. So it's your turn to guide. Okay. Um, maybe what you can do is you can look through the mirror. There will be input. And in each, in each look, you can append I. So he's saying, go, go ahead and say that and get it on the board. So basically, if the input is one, so basically you look one, <coughs> then you append I. If the input is two, you look twice, and then you append two eyes. That's how you go, at least for this requirement. That should work. So we need, so to, to simplify the intention out loud, we're going to use a loop where you go through it however many times the number that's passed in. What do we call that number here? It's input. called input. Ooh. We need better names for that soon. <laughs> that doesn't tell us much. When we get to the end of that, we will have a new stream constructed. So I'm saying out loud the basic idea. If you know how to code that, you need no more instruction. But if you don't know how to code it, he will help guide you through it. It's that straightforward. So I'm going to draw that here, kind of like this. Um, we'll call the input x for now. And so actually, I'm going to call it input. input times i is well, the answer we want, right? So if our language, I think Python lets you do that, right? You just multiply. And there's ways to do this actually in Java, but that's that's the solution you want. Yeah. So you, if you can code that loop, and you know how to code it in Java, and you do it, you know how to program in Java. So you can maybe create a for loop, and you can just add this. These are brave, brave people. Just delete all that. <laughs> you don't want it? Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead and delete it. He's guiding. I'm not guiding. I just pointed out how brave he is. <laughs> you want to have it? Okay. Uh, maybe from the line number test, you can start writing. Line numbers are really important. Yeah. Line numbers are really important. You guide. So now while they're doing that, for these people, you all understand the idea now. So wherever they're at when the timer goes off, you can guide through the next bit. And pretty soon we'll have this done. It's not important that once the big intent was described, no, 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 no. the details will happen. That's a big factor. Whatever the culture. Okay, we only have, um, when this turns over, we're done for the day. So, how does it work to this virtual work from home? Remote. It works extremely well remotely. So we working remotely. My favorite way is to use something like AnyDesk. You have your server set up with the whole development environment. Each person logs into that development environment. We can see any of the work that's being done. We just take control of the keyboard when it's our turn to take control of the keyboard. Then we use something like Zoom for our discussions. That's my favorite way to do it. But there are other ways you can use a Zoom with screen sharing and then. Uh, each developer has a development environment on their box, mm -hmm. and they just check the code in and check the code out. And then when it's the next turn, check the code. And you might take a little longer for each turn. But you can do this really quickly uh, using the AnyDesk. You familiar with AnyDesk? It gives you remote access to uh, and use of a computer as if you're sitting in front of a computer. Now, if your internet connections are not good, that's not going to be good. So this may not be so good. 
you have to have a decent internet connectivity. But I think India, I saw a report yesterday, at least around here, you can have like the super fastest 5G built in. Internet is not a problem. Like yeah. the interaction is what I was saying. Yeah, and you'll work it. This works through. This works through. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can say line number. Line 14 was a little bit called details. So we almost have the solution, and we have we have four minutes left in our session. So we're going to see this happen. Now he's guiding at a very um, detailed level right now. He's actually co writing code out loud. We try not to work that way. But we have a situation here where not everybody has the skills in this language, and we need to go down into the details. Just like if I'm telling a taxi driver, once you pass a church, make a right turn. You know, in two miles, we'll go over three bridges, we're going to make a left turn. I don't give them any more instructions than that, just so they're ready for what's coming up next. Yeah. Why? Because the return you'll need to have to leave that. Hit that test button. Yeah. We're getting back an empty string. The tests are fine. Let me go back to the story. So what? I'll give you an easy way to do this, and then we'll be done with it. Imagine okay. line fourteen is the contact. We just go plus equals. That will also do it. So remove the word contact and the dot. Space plus equals and get rid of the curly curly braces. Run your test. If that doesn't work, we're done either way. It worked. When I started working this way with our team, doing mob programming, the very first day, everybody said, we got a lot more done. The reason we get a lot more done when we work as a team is we don't have the queuing that would happen when we work alone. So if I'm working alone, and I go, oh, I don't really know how to do this. Then I go find the person who I think knows how to do it. And then they go, I'd like to help you, but I've got to finish this, so I'll talk to you in an hour. So we're including queuing time into everything we do. And the more we separate the workers, the more extended we make the uh, queuing time, the slower our work goes. We got a lot done that first day. After two or three weeks, we started recording. Compared to how we worked exactly a year before, how much were we getting done? And we were getting five to 10 times as much stuff done. Now, I won't say that's a guarantee what you're gonna get. And there were other things we were doing. We were learning test-driven development. And we were learning stuff like how to break stories down into the little, uh, very small pieces and so on. But the amount of stuff we were deploying to our users skyrocketed because of, not necessarily just mob programming, but partly because the mob programming or software team that we were doing. We were actually removing those queues, removing the extra inventory. How many things are we working on? We have five people. How many things are we working on? One thing at a time. We are doing, naturally doing something they call limited whip. There's work in progress. There's only one thing in progress. Well, why is that good? Having one thing in progress is good because our brains aren't multitasking things. We can't, our brains cannot handle multitasking. I've only read some research, I'm not a researcher, I'm not an academic, uh, I barely understand enough you know, to mumble out a few words. But from what I understand is, 
that until we complete something, our brain is going to work on it. So if we complete something, deploy it, we can work with a clean brain on the next thing. And we kind of experienced that, and we believe that's what was happening for us. We were no longer having a mind jumbled up with, oh yeah, I've got to call this guy, I've got to get the permission from the database expert to do this, I've got to talk to the product owner about that. You know, if it, every morning somebody says, I'm blocked in your meeting, then why are they blocked today in, in the morning meeting? It was yesterday that they were blocked, the moment they noticed they were blocked, it should have been dealt with. This deals with it. As long as we have all the skills and knowledge are sitting here. Now let's give these folks a hand. I think you've done this. And I apologize for putting you in the hot seat, but your thought process was really useful for the team to hear. So when you gave it out loud, the rest of the team can use that info. So, and the whole group could. So this was a little tough. And you, these are the bravest people at this conference. <laughs> So thank you very, very much. And no electrocutions today. <laughs> that was a pretty good thing. And we, we, we actually got everything working. I can't hardly believe that. I can't hardly believe it. Thank you, everybody. I think we're officially kind of done, right? Yes. I'll answer questions. I'll stay here and answer questions. I think that way you probably have a half hour break until yeah. the next thing. I'll answer questions. As a facilitator of, say, that's sampling you and a team context. What should I be looking at? Uh, I think outcomes, like, like, uh, so I don't expect people to learn how to do Roman numerals, right? Yeah, this uh, wasn't about learning Roman yeah, numerals. So when you're done with this workshop, you don't go to your resume and put, I can add Roman numerals, because no one will ever hire you again if you put that on your resume. So, <laughs> is, this, is this a way to sort of get into the no form of programming? Yes. Like one of the things so, we did this every Friday for three hours, not knowing it was going to result in mob programming. But we were learning to keep our mouths shut. We were learning to express our ideas. We were learning to just go ahead and fulfill someone else's idea. And how to continue. So when you're the navigator and you get done, your time is up, the next person should be able to continue your idea. That means you have to be good at giving the highest level explanation you can. Input times I. Okay? You can construct a string in any way to do that, but that high level is what gives you. So you're learning to do that so the next person knows what to do to complete it. And that we saw happen. We saw that happen here. So this is it. So this is teaching us those three or four things how to share, start learning to share ideas. It took me two years after I started a pair of programming, back in 1999 or 98. It took me about two years to where I could articulate my idea, and that's when I really learned the value of the whiteboard. Whiteboard is, it gives us a shared memory location, like your computer has a shared memory location nowadays, and if you, if you put it up there, it's a temporary memory location. When we're done with this, we can throw it away. You know, your computer has that inside of it, but we want it for humans. This gives us a shared memory location, so two applications, or in this case, two humans or more, can work on the same thing, be thinking about the same thing, and not have to explain it over and over and over. So we use the whiteboard, we get our highest level idea, we only go down to the details when needed, and we saw that happening too. This was quite, this was a really compact demonstration of this. But when we're mock programming, we would not necessarily rotate the navigator. And so whoever's appropriate at the moment says, yeah, I'd, I'd like to navigate because they just do it. If they start stumbling, someone else comes forward and helps. We need to be good at deferring to the other person. But if we're the kind of person who's too pushy, we have to learn how to back off. There's a lot more than I can teach mm -hmm. you in just a few minutes. This, is, uh, this takes time and uh, work on easy things at first. And uh, what changes in the virtual setting, uh, so for example, you need like a Miro board to stand It's good to have a board of some kind. If you're online, you just use Miro or whatever. Camera's on, I'm guessing. I, I like to have always cameras on when we're remote. Uh, there's a remotemobprogramming.org. If you look up remotemobprogramming.org, then you can see their instructions on this. And this guy, uh, Seaman Harris, out of Germany, uh, remote. Mob programming dot org. See if I can make spell yours. 
That's it. Oh, how did I do that? He's got a list of, um, of, of ways to work. And you can get his book for free in electronic form. And here's like, how what do we do? And he has, he has a little explanation down below for each one of these things. And I don't necessarily buy into everything he does. Don't try to use the mouse upside down. That's just stupid. Isn't it? But he's, you know, remote to everybody. It's hard to, re to work um, hybrid. It's really tough. Remote everybody, camera always on and so on. He's got a list of things and you experiment with them. It's all about an experiment. It's never, here's the rules. It's not like you're playing poker where if you don't follow the rules, someone else will shoot you, right? You, 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 you just, the rules are there to get us started and then we can forget the rules. You have a question, is that right? No, I saw your hand up like this, okay. Can you give us an example in the real world? Now the software and systems have grown up very complex. Yes. Right? The business requirements are coming uh, in, a, in a different mode. How, can you give a, a real world example? Um, well, so put, put this in place. I prefer to have the product owner as part of the team. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you. I, we don't have enough time to do too much here. Can we get to YouTube here? It looks like we can. And I don't know why this isn't at the top of everybody's search. Mob <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's that old guy? This is a video we made in 2012. Oh, you have to watch an ad first. <laughs> so this video shows us working for an eight hour day in three minutes. So there's enough instruction here to tell you quite a bit. We spend an hour every morning studying together. That keeps us learning all the time. We don't do a stand-up, because you don't have to ask, what did you work on yesterday? Because I was there. Now I'm getting more forgetful now, so maybe I do. But we stopped having meetings. Now we were using projectors. Nowadays you might work remotely, you're gonna use whatever your personal screens are. There's the concept of the driver. Now that particular person is a tester. I hired him as a tester, but he just joins us in the rotation. That's another tester. She's joining us in the rotation. There's a product owner. They come and be with us. Now, sometimes your documents, you can just work off of documents, but that's a very weak form of collaboration. I want the human there if we can. As a matter of fact, we learned a lot from that. That's a whole other story. But having the product owner there, we found to be very powerful. Now we reloaded, we started on the next thing, probably for another product owner. Uh, I'll take your question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can you take it time? Yeah. So, uh, what is the contribution of the product owner in this entire? The same thing as they normally are. The, but because things are moving so fast, they're there to answer the questions that we need to ask a product owner. If we need to wait 10 minutes to ask a product owner a question, we've taken 10 minutes out of our day. But when we're working on stuff, we might have two, three, four, five questions. And that, we've lost an hour that day. But the, they don't usually get back in 10 minutes. They get back, oh, I'll meet with you on Tuesday. We've lost a week. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. The product owner is not separate from the team. Matter of fact, if you can build, if you can make software the way I did the first 10 years of my career, I was going to be the user. So I could work directly with the user. I was going to be writing the requirements, which I never wrote requirements. They were always in my head. I was going to write the code. I was going to test the code. All the roles were in me, but we can't do that in our place of business because we have all that knowledge is spread out all over the place. If we can pretend, if we can put the five people here, that brings it back to just like it was one person with all the knowledge, we can race through all our work. But because we separate these people, there's no logic that makes it clear to me that separating people is good. People will ask me, is there any research that proves that having people work together is good? And I say, I will just ask this question back. Can you show me the research that shows that separating people is good? because it would be the exact same research, and that's how you're working now without research. Why are you working that way without research? You're separating the people. Does anybody here have research that proves that separating the people is the best way to work? I want someone to come forward someday and say, yeah, here's the studies done. The studies on pair programming pretty much showed that, yeah, it's, it, it, 
pays off to do pair programming. And I could extrapolate on that a little bit out to that probably works with a T. We found it was much more effective. So the product owner either has to be on the team or the team needs to become the product owner. There's at least, oh, it's going to tell us more stuff. Whatever they're selling, I'm not buying. Okay. Does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. The, the, if the product owner goes, hey, I'm just wasting my time, well, let me show you another video. Yeah, you opened up a can of worms here. Yeah. There's a video that we made in 2016. After I left the company, Aaron, who was the guy that we hired for the testing, he was my first hire after we started working this way. He liked to make videos of stuff, so he did a video, that first one, and then he did this one in 2016. It was a year after I left the company. There are now six teams in this picture. One manager for six teams. The manager sits right over here. You can see him, he just showed up for a second there. One manager, he doesn't need to do much managing because we can self-manage. Do any of you need to be told what to do? I can guarantee you, you do not need to be told what to do. We just need to make it where it's easy for you to do what you need to do without being told. Now, I put the sparkles in there to keep you, help you stay awake. Did that work? <laughs> Feel more awake now? It doesn't work. Six teams. Now, watch this. There's our continuous deployment area. It used to be another team was in charge of that, and now we're in charge of it. That removes the cues. Watch this. There's where our product owners sit, and we make them wear a tie so we can tell the difference between a product owner and a developer. Just kidding. That's a joke. But they're there so they can be with us whenever we need. I saw a team in London where they had six teams, and in the middle was where the product owners sat. So they were always instantly available. I'd rather have them there with us all the time. I'd rather, I don't think that, it's an artificial role to say there's a product owner. And we, everybody will give me reasons why we need that. Well, there's other things they need to do. There's not other things that the team couldn't do. Was the, the other things that the product owner needs to do, anybody can do those things. You know, they're going to go talk to the customer. Oh, okay. We can learn to talk to people. I learned how to talk eventually, so we can do these things. But as a, as a little kid, I didn't know how to talk. I eventually learned, by the time I was one years old, I think I was forming words. We can do that. I'm just making fun of product owners, I guess. I'm sorry. I have a question. Yes. So we have been talking about coding dojo and mock programming uh, and um, I would want to uh, you to sum up all the differences so that the people here also understand like the, the actual coding dojo and mock programming. Yeah, and the people who are, you know, watch that will be watching this video. Yes. From the so hopefully they will watch some of my other videos because I explain a lot of this stuff. But the, diff the coding dojo is a social activity for learning to interact with each other but it's also a social activity where you can just have fun together. I've done with groups of 10, even 15 people sitting in an array like this with a four minute rotation. Maybe you'll get two turns at the keyboard. So it's a, an artificial device. Mock programming, we, I, I typically only rotate the driver and everybody else just contributes as a navigator and that driver's turn is done. But you don't need to rotate the navigator. The navigator, I mean the, the driver. The driver could just say, I don't want to type anymore, and somebody else sits down. So the main difference is this is very structured, so we don't have chaos with strangers. And when we're working as a team, we learn what are the rules we want to follow. And the main rule is probably this, is that, oh, for, that I like to follow. If you're ready to start solving on the cloud, the dual cloud free yeah, program. I think that they want to again give us more evidence. So, what does that actually include? Okay. The main uh, strict rule that I follow that not everybody does is that the, when a driver starts driving without any instruction, we're going to have a problem. Now they might say, let me show you how you do it. That's kind of okay. But typically we would say they don't do the thinking. They only, they're, we're separating the solution and problem space from the code space. Because those are two separate things. The details of the code space will clog our brain if we're trying to think about the bigger picture. So we separate that. So the person at the keyboard just does not insist on trying their ideas. They wait till it's their turn to leave the keyboard and then share their ideas. Now that's just a little bit, but I have many videos. There's two you can find from the go-to conferences. One is on the introduction, and the other is on mock programming flow. 
And that's a good, a good start. That's a good start. Thank you so much. I'm happy, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much, Moody. Thank you so much.